Okay, uh, hi, I'm Daniel. You might remember me from last year, also moderating the security track, and welcome back to the security track then. Uh, otherwise, hello and welcome to the security track. Um, so first up now, we have Kai and Frederick uh, talking about transparency, and enjoy the first talk. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Let's see, is my microphone still working? Excellent, thanks. All right, so uh, welcome to our talk on system transparency. My name is Frederick. Uh, this is my colleague Kai. Uh, Kai, would you care to start? Hey, I'm Kai Michaelis. I'm a, I'm a hacker from Bochum, and I previously worked in the OpenPGP ecosystem, and now I'm a system security architect for Snyder and Server Security, and I'm interested in program analysis, um, cryptography, and trusted computing. And uh, my name is Frederick Stromberg. I've been interested in philosophy and computer security for over 20 years. And as a side effect of that, 10 years ago, I started a VPN service named Mulvad, together with a friend of mine, Daniel Bernson, uh, which eventually led me to meet Kai. And uh, now we stand before you here today. <clears throat> uh, and Mulvad, uh, like all other VPN providers, attempt to protect the privacy and security of their uh, users uh, by, among other things, proxying all their traffic. This puts VPN providers in great positions of power without much accountability. Uh, for that reason, their trustworthiness and transparency are imperative. For this, uh, for us, this, this insight led to uh, an obsession with the question of how do we prove our trustworthiness to our users? The following presentation is uh, one result of that 10 year long obsession. Computer security exists to facilitate trust and a fundamental part of security is system integrity. Unfortunately, computer systems are rife with vulnerabilities. Uh, administrators are in recurring races to patch before attackers exploit. Even with a good patching story, however, a system once compromised is often costly to get back to a secure state. A lack of trustworthy audit trails may prevent discovering the initial cause of the breach, resulting in inadequate mitigations. Additionally, systems also offer many places to hide and gain malware persistence. The technical challenges involved in maintaining system integrity with a relatively high assurance prevent most organizations from doing so. Today we introduce a novel design approach to ensuring and maintaining system integrity. It utilizes seven established concepts which all assist in doing so in orthogonal ways. Through their combination, new security properties emerge. Used correctly, system transparency will prevent malware persistence, provide an extensive and trustworthy audit trail, and eventually self-heal after compromise. Within certain limitations, it can be used to prove to third parties what is currently running on the system and what it has been permitted to run in the past. But before I say more, let's start with uh, let's consider three different perspectives to put us in the right frame of mind. First of all, a wonderful property of computing systems is that they do exactly what we tell them to do. Unfortunately, it turns out we are not yet very good at giving instructions. Uh, we are not very good at managing the complexity yet. Uh, regardless, computers are state machines which can be reset to an initial state. And it is from that state that we must take care to build a foundation worthy of our trust. Second of all, this is one of my favorite quotes on, on computer security. Uh, exploitation of vulnerabilities can be modeled as the practical exploration of the space of states not intended by the designer of the system. I think that's a wonderful formulation. In other words, let us make unintended state transitions hard to accomplish at all levels of abstraction. And third, well-designed modern, uh, well modern cryptographic protocols can be reduced to assumptions of computational hardness. They can be reduced to reliance on the crypto primitives involved. Uh, together with the previous perspectives, this suggests an interesting approach to ensuring system integrity. And this is what it looks like. There is the initial state immutable state of the hardware. Hardware initialization done by core boot stored in integrity protected flash memory. Network boot and verification software also stored in integrity protected flash. 
And finally, the OS and application stage reached after executing the downloaded Linux system. System transparency facilitates trust in the hardware and initial state of the system through a provisioning ritual, which together with tamper resistance uh, uh, and TPM and firmware integrity protection establishes the root of trust as well as prevents malware persistence. It requires reproducible builds of all artifacts in combination with limited system access, which deter and prevent malicious modification during the build stage as well as during runtime. It furthermore requires platform attestation of the boot chain in combination with a transparency log, which provide assurances of the current system configuration as well as an audit trail of previous configurations. If a machine using system transparency is compromised due to an unpatched application, it can reboot, load an updated system image, and attest its new patched and uncompromised boot chain to its users. Which brings us from the abstract design idea. Sorry. Which brings us from the abstract design idea and the philosophy to the implementation plan. So system transparency stands on four pillars. The first one being a unique and hard to forge platform identity, which allows us to make uh, statements about concrete systems in the system transparency context. We also need a trustworthy initial state because you can't see, we can't secure a system after it has been compromised. We need to make sure that the state the system boots in is secure and known to everybody who depends on services of the system. We also need transparent software because the software running on the system governs all the possible state transitions. We need to make sure that we can verify that these state transitions are not violating any security properties. And we need an audible boot chain in order to verify that these state transitions actually happened at boot. For the platform identity, we use a trusted computing module which is a separate microcontroller that's soldered onto the mainboard, which contains an endorsement key certificate that's infused at manufacturing time and never changes. We use that endorsement certificate to identify the platform in order to forge a link between the physical server and the endorsement key certificate, that's just a virtual thing. Uh, we use this uh, provisioning ritual, which use some kind of hard to forge proof, like a video of the provisioning of the server to establish the association between the EK and the platform. For a trustworthy initial state, we also use a feature of the TPM called the measured boot, where everything that's booted is recorded as part of a cryptographic checksum that can be read out of TPM but not written directly. Additionally, we use features like Intel TXT or temper uh, proof cases or flash protections to prevent this initial state to be changed easily. And uh, for transparent software, we need to make sure that everybody who, uh, who depends on services of this particular server can access the um, source code. Open and free software is a um, sufficient but not necessary condition for that. You can imagine a system transparency setup where all the software is proprietary, but everybody who wants to audit the system has access to the source code. What is a necessary condition are reproducible builds because our measured boot mechanism only gives us the binaries that has been executed. And we need to establish a link between this binary code and the source code we have actually inspected. And reproducible builds does exactly that. So in a system transparency context, we need to make sure that the owner of the system is the only one who decides what's executed on it. Um, especially with trusted computing, um, the owner of the system is often conflated with the platform manufacturer, and we want to avoid this in system, system transparency. Um, in order to make sure that only the owner decides what's running on the system, we use an M of N signature scheme for all the binaries that are booted via the network. So the bootloader for system transparency checks that there is a set of signatures on every binary that's fetched via the network and will boot only if the subset of these uh, signatures are valid. So for example, you can uh, have a company with five administrators and you can configure your servers um, to only accept binaries that are signed by at least three of them. So while the um, 
operator, the system owner decides what's running on the system, everybody who depends on services of the system needs to be able to audit it. And to do that, we use uh, two uh, different technologies. The first one is a public append only um, transparency lock of all the binaries that can possibly boot on a set of servers. For that, we uh, piggyback on the certificate transparency uh, ecosystem by um, issuing certificates for every binary image we want to boot on our server. Uh, the certificate is for a host name that contains the hash of the binary image. So a client can uh, monitor the certificate transparency logs, look for the certain certificates, and get um, a set of possible operating system images that can boot on the uh, platforms of one specific uh, user of system transparency. While this gives us a set of possible operating system images, we also want to ensure that a concrete server we are currently talking to runs a concrete um, operating system image. And to do that, we use another technology uh, into, in the TPM called a remote attestation, where the TPM will send us a signed version of the cryptographic uh, hash function, uh, hash sum, that has been calculated um, as part of the boot process, send us that. And then we can uh, use the reproducible builds and the accessibility to the source code to verify that the, exact, the, the source code we're expecting to be running on the server actually runs there. While this is all nice, um, we still have the problem that after booting into an operating system, we need to make sure that all the security guarantees we got from the boot chain are destroyed. Um, in order to do that, we have to, like Frederick said, limit the amount of uh, things you can do, limit the amount of uh, state transitions in the system. Um, there's a range of things you can do. And on one end, you can say, uh, we forbid any kind of SSH access into the system whatsoever, which means that all the administrators need to rebuild an operating system image every time they want to change a configuration or update package, sign that binary image, uh, issue a certificate, put it into the certificate transparency log, and then reboot the server with the new operating system. Um, on the other hand, we can say that uh, we do allow SSH access into the system, but force uh, administrator to drop into a restricted shell where only certain tasks are possible, like updating package, uh, changing configuration, reading out certificate, uh, reading out log files. Um, what solution you use kind of depends on the use case and how secure versus how obnoxious you want your system uh, to be. Um, we can't decide that for you, but uh, of, co of, of course, it would be nice to err on the side of uh, security. So, um, after that, I want to talk now about what we implemented already. So uh, we have this prototype implementation of system transparency that's based on a super microboard, the X11 SSH TF is the first modern x86 server platform that has been ported to Coboot and Linux boot. Um, we also implemented Intel TXT in Coboot. Um, Intel TXT is one of these technologies that can be used to secure this initial state. We also implemented a bootloader based on Linux boot called STBoot that implements exactly the policy I previously talked about. So STBoot is able to fetch an operating system image uh, via HTTP or HTTPS, verify the signatures, um, and we're currently working on that it uh, asks for an inclusion proof of the certificate in the certificate transparency log and then boots into the system. And uh, you will witness this now, live. So we have the uh, X11. And I have this little up squared board that's connected to the serial console to wake up here. And uh, so that's the serial output, and uh, let's go. So uh, the first thing that starts is Cobot. And um, you can see here the, the serial output of Cobot. Sadly, Cobot uh, version number is already uh, hidden, but uh, we're based on Cobot 4.10. And after a little while, Cobot starts uh, continue booting. And sadly, um, we're still running the original proprietary BMC, which takes ages to boot. And um, we have to wait here for it, because if you just continue on, things don't work, right? So uh, we have to now wait for a BMC to boot up. 
Um, we're currently investigating and in, uh, replacing that with micro uh, BMC or uh, as a UBMC or open BMC. But uh, currently, we are still depending on the proprietary implementation. So uh, you have to give, give that thing a few seconds. <laughs> okay, now okay, now it's good. So uh, as Tivo is based on Linux boot, so the next thing that happens is that we uh, fetch Linux kernel from the fresh image and boot that. So that's what's happening now. And uh, then we boot into Linux boot itself. And then the first thing that first thing that happens is that Linux boot fetches the uh, SD boot fetches the operating system image by HTTPS over the network connection here. Unpacks that and verifies verifies signatures. So we have three signatures here. These are here in the operating system image, and they all verified correctly. So we have three of three signatures that are valid. And when I press enter. It uh, continues to boot into this new kernel that has been fetched by the network. So we have the kernel booting now. And then we have systemd. And after a few seconds, we are dropped into a Linux shell. There it is. Okay, I'll turn the thing off because it's a bit annoying. So, um, in order to, in, in, for system transparency to be a viable project, we need more than just these prototype boards um, to be supported for it. Um, porting a platform to system transparency is super easy. It just needs to support co boot and Linux boot because our boot solution is based on that and it needs to provide some kind of trust anchor. Um, TPM would be the easiest because we already support it, but there's no reason why other solutions shouldn't work too. Um, also, it would be helpful if it would support one of the technologies to further secure the initial state. So, for example, we can use Intel TXT if you're on the Intel platform, or you uh, can choose a platform with effective flash protections so the uh, uh, data in the flash chip can be protected from being written. For the coming year, our plans are to develop this proof of concept further into a working product and um, have the first transparent server working in production based on the system. We also want to further develop the ST boot solution to be a uh, real open source project that's well maintained and um, other people can use. Thank you. <clears throat> which brings us to our long-term aspirations for system transparency. First of all, uh, we need a solid body of academic research to gain more confidence in its benefits and limitations. Assuming we are not wrong about uh, its security guarantees, eventually we'd like to encourage its use on a wider scale. And in the end, fewer systems might get hacked, intrusions will be discovered earlier, costs of recovery go down, and sysadmins will have a powerful tool to ensure and maintain the integrity of their systems. Your privacy relies on the trustworthiness of your digital systems, and trust is facilitated by a secure foundation. Let's make sure that foundation serves you and no one else. We are quite optimistic about the future. The potential for improvement is immense. The greatest ideas and insights lie ahead of us. Thank you. Now we move on to questions. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? No? Yes. Hey. Um, <laughs> awesome stuff. So, uh, oops, sorry. You're currently doing this based on Intel TXT. Have you looked at doing static roots of trust instead? Uh, sure. Uh, the thing is, you have to somehow secure the, the contents of the flash, right? And uh, using HTXT would be the easiest way, because uh, that would be part of our of our measure boot, and we can trust Intel, because we already have to trust Intel, right, we, using the C CPUs. 
Um, another way would be the flash protections, right? So just let's say we, we write protect uh, at least part of the flash. The thing is then the update stories get a bit more complicated and um, I'm not really a fan of that, but uh, I can understand that uh, using these uh, static root of trust makes things easier, right? Because you're kind of not dependent on vendor technology. Yeah, if you have, let's say you have a, a physical write protection of spy flash uh, containing core boot and Linux boot, uh, that obviously gives you a higher assurance, but uh, as Kai says, it makes updates much more ch uh, challenging or, and costly. Uh, another idea would be to use uh, something like um, uh, uh, the Google Titan chip, uh, which combines uh, sort of a TPM and spy flash in one, uh, which I think is an is a brilliant idea. Uh, and and uh, but as of now, we're making a proof of concept, and we're trying to figure out exactly. Um, uh, well, what trade-offs to make. Uh, and and uh, actually, in an earlier version of the talk, we didn't say limited system access, just to give an example of something else that we uh, thought about. So we called it immutable infrastructure. But, but uh, obviously, the security trade-off of immutable infrastructure versus limited system access is also costly because uh, lots of organizations don't want to reboot the machine every time you update a single microservice. So, uh, so uh, I expect that a range of, of options will be developed uh, depending on your uh, preferences. And we'll simply list uh, what options people have when they uh, deploy this in their own environment. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I was curious um, if what your guys' thoughts were, since you're doing a measured boot approach in this particular case, on how you're actually ensuring that you're not accessing things outside of the measurement itself. Um, I know that I've seen some of your patches and things like that, but like ultimately the, the code is quite complex on the access patterns and whatnot, so it's really hard to ensure that you believe that it's working the way you intend. Um, I mean, that's just from, these are the types of things I think about and, and when we're implementing them as well, especially, uh, I know about TXT specifically, but when you're talking boot guard and things like that, you only get that first little snippet and then you're, it's up to everyone else just to implement it correctly going forward so you can carry that chain of trust through. Yeah. Do you well, so um, code boot fixes part of the problem, right? Because uh, at least we can take a look at the source code and fix things that are wrong. It's supposed to be proprietary UFI implementations. Um, of course, the, the order of th how things are uh, measured at runtime uh, is hard to predict uh, from, from a static point of view. Uh, the thing is, if you have, you, you know your servers, right? So uh, when, you're, when you're running an, a fleet of system transparency servers, you can, it's, it's reasonable to expect that you know which, hard, which platforms you run it on and what the access patterns are. And at least from our, from our experience is that when you're just booting a single system, the, 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 the code path pretty much stays uh, static. So we can pre-compute PCR values for our TPMs um, reliably, and um, as long as we know the system and update them. But of course, if we say, okay, we want an, an, an ready-made solution that works for everybody on every platform, um, they need to be worked on, definitely. And, and another perspective would be that this, uh, uh, one of the things we like about this approach is that it moves us uh, in roughly the same direction as modern cryptographic protocols to reliance on more on cryptographic proofs and, and things like that. You are, of course, entirely right that uh, ultimately you need to know what the source code does because it can diverge into a path that, that is not measured by the TPM. Uh, and um, so, uh, uh, but, but the nice thing about it is that, uh, well, the, you, have to, you have to establish, there's a manual trust step in the provisioning ritual that uh, I or, or your ops team or whoever says that, yes, this is in fact a physical hardware that we provisioned. It has these specifications. Here's the hash of the artifact we flashed to the spy flash. Uh, and here is its um, uh, public key identity. But as long as you can establish uh, manual trust in, in that step, um, uh, then, then you can uh, infer from the, the hash what the source code was for that uh, piece of software, and and uh, and you move up the stack. So you also have to 
of course, uh, uh, look at the source code, uh, but everything in between is is um, uh, automatically verifiable, uh, which is a, a very nice um, uh, place to be because then you can focus your efforts on the provisioning ritual and the establishing trust in the in the source code, and everything else is taken care of. And then you also, of course, assuming you have the right main board, uh, uh, you can reboot the machine and you don't have any malware persistence. So yeah, those are some of the ideas. Yeah, more questions? So what are you using uh, for an attestation client server and how are you providing the golden measurements? Are you using the TCG reference manifest spec or how are you doing that? Um, Cobot contains uh, tools to do that. So Cobot contains tools to pre-compute the uh, hash rails without having a lock. Um, and for the remote attestation, so we're planning to use open source implementation. So let's say things like Keyline, for example, um, that already provide that. And uh, on the client, there are tools like the Intel uh, TPM tools to do that. But of course, you can also, the, the Cobot implement, implements the TCPA lock nowadays. So uh, we can read that out and use that for computing the hash values too. So there's tooling. It's not really easy to use. Um, it's a project that's in the works, right? That's something I would expect from this ST boot project to have ready-made tool that could pre-compute me my hash values and provide some kind of software solution to do the remote attestation. More questions? No? All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, attending. Yeah.